Yeah. Okay, cool. I'm going to hit the go live button. Here we go. Cool. Hello, everyone. Um, it's Nick Wilshire, and this is the reschedule talk um, where we have Tim Forsman as our, our guest. Um, and sorry about last week. Uh, it was uh, just a week full of load shedding, and unfortunately, Tim was caught in the middle of it. And um, you know, he wasn't able to get to a working building with power and internet connection. So it all just went <laughs> up in smoke. Um, but we are very lucky that he's been flexible and happy to reschedule for this week. Um, I know we're um, probably not going to have as many people in the audience as the, the normal schedule, but the talk is on the same link. And we will um, advertise it after this uh, talk just so that everyone who missed it can go back and watch it in uh, in their uh, in their own time. So Tim um, is a, a senior lecturer lecturer at the University of Pumalanga uh, in cultural and heritage studies, and has worked at the University of Pretoria, uh, where he spent two years as a postdoctoral reader before a year at the University of Witwatersrand, and for PGS heritage. So I also know strangers to to Oxok, um, on the big uh, dam mitigation project in Lesotho. Tim is a current recipient of the National Research Foundation's African Origins Platform Grant, which will fund his research into forager technologies, um, innovations, and indigenous knowledge systems during the rise of the Mapungubwe state. The study falls under the Hunter-Gatherer Archaeological Research Project, which aims to develop a more inclusive history of forages in the Middle and Popa Valley. His research interests include forager-farmer interactions, forager economies, trade dynamics, landscape archaeology, and rock art. Tim is also an editorial board member at Azania Archaeological Research in Africa and has completed a book titled Forages in the Middle Limpopa Valley, Trade, Placemaking and Complexity. And I really encourage all of you to go out and get the book if you don't have a copy of it. It's a really excellent book. Um, Tim's uh, talk this evening um, is focusing on the Middle Limpopa Valley landscape and the period of social upheaval um, involving foragers and new perspectives on on this very uh, thorough and um, robust research base that he's built up. So um, without further ado, um, let's uh, turn it over to Tim. And uh, thank you very much for being our speaker this evening. Tim. Thanks, Nick. I really appreciate it. Um, thank you for the nice introduction. Uh, it's very kind. And um, I'd just like to first off begin by thanking everyone for returning for round two. Uh, round two, one was very underwhelming, uh, <laughs> and uh, my apologies uh, sincerely for that. Uh, I think I'm not quite sure what it is, but it's something to do with load shedding and our internet connection, and it was a pretty um, widespread problem we were experiencing. So thank you again for coming back. I really do appreciate it. I'd just like to say thanks to the Archaeology Society um, for inviting me to do this talk. I'm quite thrilled to be here. Uh, obviously, we'd probably all prefer to be in person. This, this means it's much more accessible, and, and that's fantastic. I'm, I'm very grateful. And I'm also uh, very appreciative of all the, the work that um, Nick has been organizing this, um, assisting with all the issues last week and in, and in setting this up again. So thank you very much for that. Um, so my talk uh, today is titled Foragers During a Period of Social Upheaval on the Middle and Purple Valley Landscape. Uh, it's quite an attractive title, I think. Social upheaval, it, it, it invokes a lot of sort of thought and, and you know, what exactly am I talking about? And that's kind of the point, I guess. <laughs> Um, and this, this work is something that we, we're really uh, escalating from this year. So it's something um, that we, we're pushing forward with. Uh, we've now uh, received a, a large grant from the National Research, Research Foundation. We also have support for our students from the Paleontological Scientific Trust. So this brings in a lot more resources for us to play around with, uh, to um, do a lot more in the field, do a lot more of analysis, um, and, um, and, get, and find out a lot more about, about the particular region. The, the half that you see on the top left, um, this is our research project. Uh, it stands for Hunter Gatherer Archaeological Research Project. Uh, it's, it's, a, it's quite a broad project, a lot of students involved, a lot of collaborators, but ultimately what it is is an umbrella that, um, that brings, about, brings in a lot of hunter gatherer research, primarily at this stage focused in northern South Africa, but we've had studies or, uh, in the Northern Cape, and we have an ongoing study in, in Pumalanga through one of, one of the PhD students associated with this project. Half you, please, I'd like to encourage you all to follow us. We, we try to be very active on social media to try and um, spread information around our research, the things that we do, 
we, we're not, it's not purely to make people jealous, but I must confess that's a part of it. So, um, we do get to spend some, a lot of time in some really nice parts of the world. So, um, but yeah, please, if, you know, on Instagram, we share a lot of images. We do daily feeds when we're in the field, so you can see progress, you can see how our excavations unfold, uh, some of the things that we find, some of the things we're thinking about while we're in the field. We also have uh, now a WhatsApp group that you can join. It's closed to comment, so it's only the admin that can comment. But it just allows us to share information, uh, you know, about these talks, for example, articles we've, we've written, um, anything of interest. It, it also allows us to have live sessions when we're in the field with videos, things like that. Um, so it's quite a nice way of, of sharing information and sharing a community of people. So I, I will share a link to that at the end for anyone who's interested. But I'd like to reiterate that it's something that we only admin share, you know, pertinent information every now and then. But uh, this project, yeah, we, we're trying to do a lot. We've got a lot of people involved. Um, we've spent a bit of time in the field, not as much as we wanted to because of COVID, obviously. Um, but now that that's becoming much more relaxed, we will be spending a lot more time doing some fun things in the bush and learning about um, archaeology. Um, so today what I'm going to talk about, it, this, a lot of what I'm talking about relate to our HARP project. Um, but it, it, it relies on work that's been done by many others. Uh, at the end of the talk, I will move, uh, when I start talking about change and opportunities um, among forager society, that's when I'll start talking a bit more about what we've been up to recently. But I'm going to give a bit of a background to the Middle and Popa Valley. Why? Why are we even, why are we so interested in hunter-gatherers in this part of the world? Uh, there are many other parts of Southern Africa, so why here? Um, I'll look a bit at the peopling and patterns of this landscape. Um, and then unpack a little bit for you what I mean by social upheaval. Uh, and then we'll look a little bit at, at, at forest change opportunities and, and what we're busy with at the moment. So for anyone who's not entirely familiar, um, this is Africa. Uh, in the red block is Southern Africa. And if we zoom in there, uh, my apologies, the, this map came out a little bit pixelated. Uh, but if we zoom in there, this is the Botswana, Zimbabwe, Mozambique, South Africa landscape. You can see the Eastern coastline of Mozambique and the fringes of eastern um, Namibia. And in this area, there's a lot of really significant sites. Uh, I've marked off a number of them on this map. Uh, these um, come from various time periods. They're not all from the same period in time, um, but they're quite influential uh, during the occupation phases. And what's interesting, a lot of these are very connected to one another. This landscape, the Middle and Popo Valley landscape, the rivers connecting to the coastline where a lot of trade was coming in, and this trade moving into the Mapungubwe Limpopo Valley region, um, where it was being centralized at Mapungubwe and then distributed into the interior or into the hinterland. And then obviously that was a two-way street with local resources coming into Mapungubwe and then going towards the coast. Now, that idea of centralization where trade wealth is moving through this area has been challenged recently with um, people arguing that it wasn't as centralized as we make it out to be. But nonetheless, in this particular area, these, area, these regions, these sites were very connected. Um, they were connected to the coast, they were connected to trade. So they played a role in terms of a landscape sense, they played a role in one another's histories. And so this is the area that I'm gonna be um, talking about uh, today. The landscape itself is quite beautiful. Uh, for anyone who's been out there, it's a stunning and remarkable place. I'd highly encourage a, a visit. Uh, in this particular image taken by Neil Eldridge, um, on the right-hand side, you can see the Shashi River, a very large span of uh, water over there. That doesn't flood all the time, but when it does, it's, it's particularly impressive. And in the river, in the sort of center of the frame is the Limpopo River. This is uh, obviously a stunning photograph, but this is quite typical of the landscape. If you have it, you have these copies, these hill ridges that are near to the Limpopo and uh, riverine forest in these in the, in the, here are a few more images of this landscape. <clears throat> the top left image, uh, you it's looking from actually from Little Muck Shelter's ridge, the ridge, the sandstone ridge that Little Muck Shelter's found in looking south from that ridge towards the next sandstone ridge, which is in that in this case Leokwe Hill that you can see standing up there across the trees. Um, and this is kind of the sandstone area, what it looks like. You have a series of ridges that are fairly spaced far apart, the further south you go. But as you move towards the mobile belt, the Limpopo area, um, it becomes sort of a, a just a, a sort of condensed mess of sandstone. And in that you find shelters and um, various really interesting spaces. So the image below 
uh, far drier time of year. Look, this is what it's sort of currently looking like. Um, almost, the trees are still quite green up there, but the grass is, is mostly gone. Um, this is now on the farm Balerno, which is now part of National uh, Mapungubo National Park, and it's looking towards two sites that I'll briefly talk about, Balerno Shelters 2 and 3. But here you can see where there's a lot more co copies. Uh, it's a bit more of a, of a sort of a mix up. Uh, the top right image is a photograph from the top of Mapungubwe uh, overlooking uh, towards towards um, the edge. And you just get a bit of a sense of that landscape where Mapungubwe Hill is located. And then the bottom right image, I'm just trying to show you a variety of images of this landscape. The bottom right image is actually a very similar location to the top left image, if you, if you can believe it. That's the Kalopi River. So it's the river, the dry riverbed in the top left image. Um, but it's looking in an opposite direction. It's looking towards the ridge that I'm standing on in the top left image. Um, but you can see if you look at these bottom images, for example, just how variable this is in terms of uh, rainfall patterns uh, from seasonally. Um, so here, the environment is a dry savanna environment. It, the rainfall fluctuates annually quite significantly, anywhere from 140 to 500 mils of rain per annum. Um, so it's very variable. Um, as you can see in some of these images, or as you can imagine from these images, there's a series of microhabitats. You know, along the rivers, I've mentioned this riparian woodland, where you get these nice big trees. They would have been more extensive back in the day. Um, but you also, in the copies, you get um, nice succulents growing there. There's a lot of fruiting species on this landscape, baobab, marulas, many of them not standing any longer, uh, thanks to our big gray uh, four-legged friends that roam around this area. Um, but this area supports a large amount of biomass that, as you can see, fluctuates seasonally, um, although there's a lot to support wildlife as well as domestic crops at a later stage. What's interesting about this landscape and quite important are flays. There's about at least three large flays in the area. The Shashi Limpopo, where, where they meet, it forms a flay up the Limpopo River as a result of back flooding. But there's also flays where the Pitsani in Botswana meets the Limpopo and where the Matlotsi and Limpopo meet one another. And these flays hold water well into the into the dry season, um, become good grazing grounds, good agricultural areas. And um, currently on the farms in Start and Samaria, the flays have been uh, converted into wetlands now, so they're permanent wetlands, which is obviously not natural, uh, but it's become a very important stopover for many migratory birds. So if you are into birding uh, and you do come and visit the area, and you're sick and tired of watching us excavate in the dust or visit archaeological sites, which I don't think it's possible to get tired of archaeology, but maybe for some it is, um, there's some phenomenal birding that you can go and enjoy um, at the Malutwa bird hide. Alrighty, so um, that's a bit of an introduction to the landscape. And for those of you who visited or know about this area, you, you, it's probably covered things you already know. But this is Little Muck Shelter. This is the site that we were primarily interested in. We began excavating Little Muck in 2020, uh, obviously heavily delayed from COVID, unfortunately. Uh, this was one of our earlier trips up to the site just to map it. You get a really good sense of how dry it was when we were there. Uh, it shocked us when we, when we returned for our second field season that everywhere you see where there's sand was thick grass because of the brilliant rains we had at the end of 2020 and the early part of 2021. Um, so this site was originally excavated by Simon Hall and Ben Smith. Um, they uh, excavated the site and found a really interesting sequence, a sequence that can for general purposes, be broken down into four phases. The earliest phase, which is at the lowest part of the shelter, is probably about more than 2,000 years old, maybe not by much. Um, and it's kind of a pre-contact phase before the arrival of farmers, possibly before the arrival of herders on this landscape. And um, at this time, the site was being used as a campsite. So hunter-gatherers were living at the site, performing a variety of activities, such as hunting, gathering, um, producing ostrich eggshell beads, uh, probably snaring and trapping as well as um, you know uh, sh uh, shooting at animals with bow and arrows. So there's a variety of the kinds of activities we've, we've become used to seeing. And then in the early first millennium that begins to change and there seems to be an emphasis, what well, seems to be, there is an emphasis on stone scrapers which appears to be related to craft activities. So there's this increase in craft, craft production at the site. That intensifies at around 8900 and this is when Zizo farmers arrive. Before then in the first millennium AD there are farmers in the extended region. We don't know any homesteads yet in the, this, on this particular landscape, but there is um, rainmaking sites from that period on this landscape. So it's very possible people were living here then. But from 8900, farmers firmly established themselves in this region. We see a massive increase in craft goods. 
and a decline in most other activities. So this site becomes a workshop. Um, at about 81,000, when Leopard's Coffee people move in, sorry, who became K2 farmers and eventually Malcolm Goodworth, uh, they appropriated the space. Foragers seem to have abandoned it or relinquished it up to relinquished it to the farmers. And this may have become a initiation site. The trees that you can see uh, on the on the left, there's a knot thorn back there and a, and a worm. But behind those trees is a series of engravings on the ground there, hollows, cupules, and gimbals, possibly related to a farmer use of the site. The the the, the scrapers, we've done an analysis of the scrapers. We did a use way analysis. We found that they they seem to have been they seem to be emphasis on the production of rigid material. Not sure what crafts were being produced, but based on deterioration patterns on those artifacts, when we stuck them under microscopes, uh, it seems that that deterioration is consistent with the, with with contact with rigid materials like bone, wood, possibly shell, tortoise shell, ivory, anything hard like that. Um, so what we were very interested in in this site, what got us going on this landscape was in fact the in ceramics and metal which would have come from farmers so we and we were interested in unpacking and, and learning more about the social relations between these different groups I just before moving on I want to mention that if you look at the shelter the column in the center of the site there there is some rock art on that column but to the left of that 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 whitish rock not the upper one the lower one in the middle there, uh, there's a lot of rock art, including elephant and kudu and pala and a lot of people, as well as really brilliantly drawn giraffes. And then behind me, from where I'm taking this photograph, is a very small panel of humans running with arrows and bows. So just to zoom in a bit more onto this landscape to give you a sense of what areas I'm talking about, you can see the, the Shashi and the Limpopo rivers. <clears throat> the initial photograph of those two rivers was more or less where the the G is of MPG, which stands for Malcolm Goodway. Um, sort of in the middle of your frame here, but slightly to the bottom right is LMS. That's the Little Muck Shelter. And you can see that there's a number of sites in the area. LH is Leopold Hill. There's rainmaking sites. Um, and these black dots all represent forager sites, hunt gatherer sites that have been excavated. Doesn't include sites that haven't been excavated. Uh, the white dots are prominent farmer sites on the landscape. These are just some of them. Um, if you know the work of Thomas Huffman, for example, you'll know that there's a great many that have been excavated in this area. We have a very good sense of what's going on because of that work. Um, and if you have if a look at the lightish gray, these are what we call, what I've called mixed identity sites. These are sites that are homesteads or settlements, but that appear to have foragers residing in them uh, for temporary periods. We're not sure, maybe just visits, maybe seasonal visits, or maybe more long-term occupations. We're not quite sure, and I'll mention them a bit later. And then the other, the rain control site. So this is kind of the landscape that I'm talking about today. Many of these sites will, I'll, I'll be discussing in a bit more detail. Um, so it's it's running largely along the street. Where you see these sites is more or less where you find this uh, the, the sandstone, but there are obviously sites outside of this as well. So the period in time that we're going to be looking at briefly here is about 1220 BC and through until 1300 AD. And it's during this period that you see a change. And this is this time frame that I'm, when I refer to social upheaval, I'm talking more, more or less about what's going on here. So the, the period before about 8100 at least, uh, you more than likely have hunter-gatherers on this landscape alone. However, we have this issue of herders, which uh, if you, you may be familiar with, um, it's a really fascinating part of our, our history here, our prehistory, where, but it's a one that's very difficult to put our finger on. And um, so we have rock art in this area that is thought to have been produced by herder communities, Koi Koi communities, but we have nothing in the excavated sequences that clearly show an occupation of the of, or even a presence on this landscape. So they seem to have been there based on the rock art, but we, we're not finding anything else. So they would have possibly been there around 2,000 years ago. You know, it, it is debated. I'm not going to get into the debate because it's outside of the, the, this talk, but more or less at this period in time, we're seeing just foragers. It's often referred to as pre-contact. That's in reference to farmers, so pre-contact with farmers. But forage groups, different forager groups, uh, from different backgrounds, we know from ethnography that in some cases vastly different from one another, would have encountered each other and, and possibly interacted. So it's certainly not a period of no interaction. It's just a period before the arrival of farmer groups, and that's what pre-contact refers to. The 100 to 800 period, uh, the early contact phase, this is a term um, uh, Bronwyn van Dernen brought in when she was doing her PhD. And... Um, 
she, oh, sorry, this period is characterized by contact with possibly Bombata producers, which may or may not have been farmers, depending on, on the debate and which line you take as well. Um, but certainly later, happy rest farmers. Um, and then we have the Zizo phase. This is when, for example, at Little Muck, you get this really intense crop production to place. And then we have the 81,000 phase, which is leopards coffee groups coming in and essentially an acceleration in change that led to the establishment of the Mapungubwe capital. Here is an image, a photograph of Mapungubwe. Um, this is looking uh, pretty much towards the court area, uh, up onto the hill, which is where people were settling. And, and, and it's large as a result of this hill that I talk about social upheaval in the area. Here's another image. Uh, this is just showing the um, a map of Mapungubwe. So if you look at the court area at the bottom, sort of to the left where those rocks are, that's kind of where the photograph was taken, looking towards the palace and rainmaking areas of the hill. Around the base of the hill, it was likely royalty or elite groups. Um, and then on top of the hill, in where it's marked palace, was a, a royal residence. Uh, royal wives would have been based on the hill as well. The graves marked in here, this is where the uh, items were, uh, were found uh, in, in buried with uh, three, uh, three individuals. Um, there's a rainmaking area to the back, and this is a nice rendering of what that hill may have looked like uh, from from uh, Tom Huffman's book. So when we talk, what, what I'm talking about on this particular landscape is, you know, Mapungubwe appears at around 80, 12, 20. However, it's not a case of so what we see here is, is the first Zimbabwe culture uh, settlement. We see the first state level society, and that's marked by uh, a number of things: the accumulation of wealth, uh, including Foreign wealth, wealth, of course, is the beads coming in, um, porcelain eventually, cloth and, and, and various items. Uh, the centralization of this wealth through a capital like Mapungubwe. We see the, the ruler separating himself by living on top of the hill with royalty around the base of the hill and then your subsistence-based farmers further off. This is very different to what you have seen before, which is a central cattle pattern. Your, your headman uh, around kraal with people organized around him and a court alongside the kraal. The kraal now has been relocated. It obviously can't be on top of the hill, and it's in that greener area to the left. Uh, so a, a total shift in the way the settlement set up. Uh, we also see that the leader takes on uh, a much heavier spiritual role in the landscape and among the people. He's the ac access to the ancestors, and he's also in charge of controlling the rain. So there's a number of changes that take place that that mark this as the state level society or this urban center, the first of its kind in southern Africa. There has been uh, arguments put forward recently that it, that there are sites that predate this, in particular Mapela Hill. Um, so it is debated at this stage and discussed, but the evidence is, is still overwhelming me that Mapungubwe was earlier. But you know, you know, we'll see with, with ongoing work what, what comes of that. Um, so this is not a case of, of going to bed on, on, a, on a Sunday night and saying to everyone, hey, tomorrow when we wake up, we're a state-level society, get ready, pack your bags, you know, hashtag state-level society on Twitter. This is not a case of that. This is a lengthy sequence of development, as you would imagine. This is something that just happened overnight. And so the roots of much of this change began in at least the late first millennium AD. At those early stages, it was probably not a case of going, all right, we're going to start this now so that in 300 years we can have a state-level society. It's just something that, that developed out of the opportunities that arose. Um, but but the, the important factors that took place during the Mapungubwe phase and that contributed to Mapungubwe have much earlier roots. So let's shift away slightly. Now, that's, that's why this is interesting to us. There's all these changes that happen is what I've been calling social upheaval happening in this area. But let's take a step back slightly and let's look at hunting gatherers. I, I particularly love this image, and I love the, this image in the context of, of what, are we, what we're trying to achieve. This is a photograph from National Geographic. You can see four members of the San community walking here in the Makadikadi pans in Botswana. And it, what I like about this image is it kind of it evokes a sense of isolation uh, uh, of uh, contactless people. Uh, it's very self-sufficient, incredible at uh, navigating the environment and surviving in it. Um, and this is certainly an argument that was developed that came out in the, the 50s, 60s, 70s uh, from a lot of ethnographic work that was being conducted in the, in the Khanzi area, the Nyanya area, in, in, in the Dobi, in Botswana, in the Bibian. And, um, and this was heavily challenged in the 80s where uh, a number of archaeologists and anthropologists critique these views of isolationism, uh, of archetypal societies, uh, this hunting, hunting and gathering egalitarian society as being sort of a, a pan a, a pan capture society where many people around the world uh, behave like this at some period in time. 
And they challenged that and said, in fact, what we're seeing here is a lengthy period of, of, of contact, at least 1,500 years of contact with farmer communities that has contributed to the appearance of the San society, that has contributed to the behavior patterns as, for example, hunter-gatherers. Um, they also argued in favor of things such as subordination, um, that the hunter-gatherers often fulfilled a very low status in local societies. And so what I like about this image, the next layer when you peel it back um, is if you have a look in the, in the, in, you know, the direction these, these individuals are walking, you can see some shadowy figures back there, and those are cattle. And so the, this obviously, you know, cattle are not indigenous to this part of the world. Hunter-gatherers herding cattle or any livestock, it relates to some form of contact or some form of relations with someone else at some point in time. And so this is this you know, enigma that we see is, is identifying the, these levels of contact and the way that we've perceived San communities as a result of ethnographic accounts and as a result of colonial accounts as well, when we, when we look back a little further. So I like this image because it, it brings across these two different dynamics that we, we kind of see in, in, or at least maybe I'm going a bit crazy. That's also very possible. People do tell me that a lot. Um, but that's sort of what I see with this with, with this very striking image. All right. So what, what I'm going to do now is, uh, with, with well, with the talk that I'm going to bring now is, is a lot of the work we're doing is to try and challenge some of these views, to try and reinvestigate it. And in some sense, uh, from a post-colonial perspective, start to look at how we represent Sarn society and together us within these bigger contact environments. And that's why the Middle and Popo Valley to this project is really important, because you had the social upheaval. You have these very significant developments. Um, and members of the Sarn community and together were there at that time. They were part of this. Um, they were present and available on that landscape. And it allows us to start to think about other elements of Sarn society. For example, you know, whether Sarn, uh, where the sites that were being used became ranked. So you had some sites more important than others. Whether we see the accumulation of wealth within Sarn society. Whether we see complexity forming. And these are conversations that are not in isolation. Uh, Antonietta Gerardino, for example, um, and, and others along the West Coast um, have spoken about these elements, these where, where science society buzz, does become more complex later in time. Um, and it, currently in the Northern Cape, or not currently, but in the Northern Cape, there's a study conducted by Marley's Lombard and colleagues looking at these funnel sites, which are fantastic and very interesting. And that also speaks to a permanence on the landscape, which is contrary to the evidence when we think about mobility in hunter-gatherer society being highly mobile people. Um, so there is there's a lot of archaeology that's coming up and starting to challenge some of these views, whether directly or indirectly. And that's kind of what we're trying to achieve with our study as well. So let me jump into, into the archaeology now. This is a beautiful site uh, called Bologna Main Shelter. It was excavated by Simon Hall. And uh, was uh, and Bronwyn Mandurnum. It was a big part of her PhD. Um, it's a it's a phenomenal shelter. It looks like it, it is a standalone copy, but it's surrounded by copies. You just can't see any of them in the frame here. Um, it's a very large shelter. Has a very high ceiling. It's by no means the biggest in the area, but it certainly is one of the most impressive where you stand in front of it. There are other shelters that are very long because they're running along the edge of those ridges, for example. But they don't have very high ceilings, and they're also not very deep. Sip of water. Here is a, a map of the excavations at the site. And we see on the top right, uh, this is where, well, there's two excavated areas. There's the top right excavations. Then there's the drip line excavations. The drip line excavations haven't actually been analyzed yet, but the top right excavations have been, um, and they were part of Roman's PhD, which is really quite fascinating. Um, sorry, let me just get some here. Yeah. Oops, sorry. Um, so it's getting a bit hot and stuffy in this room. We've got a lot of rain here, and it's quite humid. Um, so the dripline excavations were conducted primarily because if you look in the rest of the shelter, there's grain, there's um, dugger features, there's flooring, for example. And so the excavators wanted to ensure that when they did move into the shelter, they weren't going to destroy or damage or disturb any of this other, these other features in case they were significant. So they exposed all of that. And in the meantime, we're excavating outside the shelter. When they realized that they had this dung crust and crawler area to the to the right here on the map, they then focused their attention in that area so not to disturb this other uh, element of the site's occupation. The drip line excavation has not been analyzed. Um, it's something that we will be looking at it, as part of this project. Simon Hall has kindly allowed us to, to take over his material and have a look at it. It's something we'll start soon. But the, the excavations inside are what form part of Bronwyn's PhD. 
here is the stratigraphic sequence from the wall nearest to the shelter. And so you can see these different soil layers, DC, VOD, these are separate from one another. If we begin at the bottom of the excavation, I'm not going to talk about this, but if we begin at the bottom of the excavation, you'll see a date of about 11,000 years ago. This is once calibrated, putting us at about 11,500 to 10,500 BC. It represents the earliest date we have on late Stone Age material in this valley. At this stage, none of the other excavated sites were occupied. Whether this has to do with has geological reasons, whether it's that there were very few people living in the valley, whether it's they were living in different areas, we're not quite sure because this is the only one. And it, because it falls outside of what we've been looking at in this valley, myself included, Bronwyn, no one's had a look at it yet. So it has a lot of potential. Um, but what we're primarily interested in so far in this valley is these, uh, in this case, the BRA levels, the DBG levels, um, and that's this contact period stuff. I'm not going to talk in huge detail about what was recovered from the, from the excavations in Belluna, Maine. Uh, numbers and frequencies and things like that, um, part, uh, because I want to talk about it more generally. Um, but this is published material um, that Bronwyn's published, that I've published on as well, as an, an Iris Gilamard recently in her PhD. Um, but what you tend to find at Berlin May, which is very interesting, is that from the pre-contact levels, there's very little change at the site. So pre-contact into the contact phases, including all the way through to the Mapungube period, there's no significant change in the shelter in terms of the production of artifacts, the types of artifacts, and the preferences, and, and the intensity, no, sorry, the frequency. So there's continuity in the site. And this is really quite interesting um, because it speaks to a, a, a continuity in function of the site and use of the site. So what's interesting about that is, although there's all these changes happening on this landscape, the way that Berlino main shelter was being utilized by hunter-gatherers changes very little. Yeah, there are some changes, um, but nothing nothing significant. And that's really quite fascinating. Uh, Bronwyn talks about this as being an aggregation site. Aggregation is when hunter-gatherers came together, they performed various activities, or ritual activities, and they produced a lot of artifacts. Beads, for example, the top right. Uh, they hunted frequently for feasting purposes, marriage rituals. Um, they exchanged gifts with one another. And so you, you have a big buildup of material. And that's certainly what, what's happening at, at, at Berliner Main. There's a nice engraved fragment of a bone tool. There's some decorated pottery, which would have come from farmer communities. And there's also a pendant made from um, freshwater mussel. So there's a lot going on at the site. The, in, the opposite of this are dispersal camps. And this is when the groups separate into smaller bands, um, family units, siblings, separate into smaller bands and they, uh, they perform fewer activities, so there's a less of a buildup of, of archaeological material. They're not performing uh, rituals, marriages, exchanges, for example. And so we can distinguish these archaeologically. And, and Bronwyn talks about Berliner Shelter 3, which is photographed here. Berliner Shelter 2 is to the left of this image, and it's probably about a pitching wedge away. So it's 120 meters, not even, it's like less than 100 meters away. Um, and that has a very similar sequence. Chasiko shelter also, uh, Dombo shelter to an extent. What we're seeing at these sites is there's not as high a buildup of archaeology as there is at Bologna Main. In some cases, there's a lot. But we're seeing as time goes by, there's this gradual decline. And into the contact period, there's few artifacts. And it seems like the sites are being used almost less and less. There's less of a buildup of formal materials. There's less consumption happening here. And so it's not exactly clear why that's happening at these sites and not at others, but that's really what's happening. Okay, the next two sites I'm going to, I'm going to talk about are Zombo and J J uh, Little Muck. So these are maps of Zombo and Little Muck. You've seen Little Muck already. I've mentioned some things about Little Muck. Zombo is something I excavated for my PhD. Um, we, we, we excavated inside the shelter as well as outside the shelter. This is what the site looks like. You can see it's not as big. Um, it has a smaller internal area with a lower ceiling and less space. But outside, there's a lot of space. Little Muck, on the other hand, has a much higher ceiling, a lot more space. Not, not a lot of protected space, but still quite a bit. And also a large into, um, open area in front. The sites are about 27 kilometers apart. You can see them in red here. Um, they're actually in very similar context. They're both in a paleo floodplain environment. They're both surrounded surra by Mapani felt. They shelters next to water networks, and they're all both in close proximity to large Iron Age settlements. Uh, Little Muck is close to Liyokwe Hill, and Zombo is close to Mamagua. 
here's a, a close-up of Zombo. Um, you can see the site. It's, it's about 600 kilometers, uh, 600 kilometers, geez, 600 meters from the hilltop at Mamagua. But that Mamagua complex would have sort of spread around that hilltop. It's, it's a, an incredible site. And so they're within a few hundred meters of a farmer settlement. Little Mac, on the other hand, is about one and a half kilometers from the Oakley Hill. So again, a bit closer. If you're looking at some of the other areas that uh, were occupied at the time that the Oakley Hill was occupied. So these two sites are very similar to one another, but they have very different archaeological sequences. So at Zombo Shelter, for example, we see a, um, a mixed bag in the early contact period. So the pre-contact, which is phase one here, we see some scrapers and back tools. But as you move into the contact period, there becomes an emphasis on back tools. And this is slightly unusual. Normally, we see scrapers dominating. As you see, the figures are not very high. We're not talking about a lot of a lot of artifacts here, but there is an in significant increase in back tools. Uh, scrapers stay more or less the same. In phase three, which is the Zizo period, 8,900 to 1,000, that emphasis on back tools grows. And then in the leopard scorpion phase, after 81,000, it's mostly scrapers, uh, a heavy emphasis on scrapers. When I, I looked at these four diagnostic impact fractures, and in that phase two and phase three, not only is there an increase in back tools, but there's also an increase in the frequency at which uh, fractures are occurring on those stone tools. And those fractures are consistent with damage patterns uh, replicated in hunting, in hunting um, experiments. So it appears that hunter-gatherers at this period were hunting more frequently, more intensively during that phase, and then it kind of disappears. But what's interesting is although in 8,000 you see a drop-off of back tools, the, the, the regularity of damage per back tool is as high as in the previous phases. So there are fewer back tools, but they seem to be using them as frequently. Um, if we look at little muck, there's a, a difference here. Here we see not many back tools. There's only 27 from phase one to phase four. But instead, we see a massive emphasis on scrapers. So this is what uh, Simon and Ben were talking about in their paper, this big increase in, the, in workshop activities and craft activities and it's driven by stone scrapers. Um, phase two is 142, which and phase two spans probably at least, we're talking about a 500 year period. And phase three, which is a 100 year period, has 185. So if you think about how many are produced per month, for example, um, phase three dominates. Of course, in phase two, they may have only lived there once for three weeks. And in phase three, they may have lived there for 50 years. We don't know. So do you think that the, the, is not really real, but you see a big dominance and a higher density in phase three of these of these um, uh, scrapers. Now, like the back tools, we looked at the scrapers under microscopes, we looked at use wear patterns, and we um, identified a range of different types of wear, so polishes, fractures, striations, edge damage, on these different artifacts that's consistent with working rigid materials, as I mentioned earlier, bone, wood, but also possibly ivory, shell, ostrich eggshell, so similarly to Zombo, what we see is an increase in the frequency of wear patterns on these artifacts at the same time that they themselves are increasing in numbers. So it's not just a case of, okay, well, there are more artifacts, so there's going to be more with use wear or damage on them. What we're seeing is the percentage with use wear damage is also increasing, which is indicating that as there's an increase in the frequency or the number of these artifacts, there's also an increase in the intensity of their use, it seems. And at the same time that this is happening, we are seeing an, an increase in trade item at both of these sites. And that's also obviously um, significant. Right, so I'm going to just briefly talk about these sites so that I don't go over time significantly. Uh, Gao Shelter is another site I excavated for my PhD. Um, it has two components, a rock shelter, which you can see on the left there. It's quite a nice rock shelter with a little bit of rock art in it. And then there's a homestead uh, where there's some walling, there's a, a crawl area, and there's a few mittens, human burials, and so on, what we suspect to be human burials. Um, the, 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 stone, the assemblages from each is very different. In the open, it's very typical of a farmer type uh, assemblage, which is what you'd expect. In the shelter, very typical of a forager type assemblage, which is also what you'd expect. And incredibly comparable to, to other, uh, other forager sites. But in the open, in both areas, which occupied very possibly at the same time, which is what, which is what it seems, in the open area, we also find a pretty impressive stone tool assemblage in, in areas very typically associated with, with farmer occupations and farmer activities. 
which, which leads us to think that what we're looking at here are hunter-gatherers spending time in the farmer settlement with farmers, potentially residing there for any length of period. We, we can't be sure at this stage. It may be uh, seasonally. It could be just every now and then. It could be just to perform activities, but it could also be on a long-term basis. So we see this happening at Jao, and Jao dates to 81,000. Another site dating to 81,000 is Euphorbia Corp. This was a, the focus of someone's masters not too long ago. Um, and here, in a very similar fashion, we have a rock shelter, and we have stone tools coming out of there, and we also have this nice farmer settlement with terracing going up the hill. And in, in, in these areas, we're also finding a nice variety of, of stone tools that are very consistent with the kinds of stone tools foragers have been producing for thousands of years. So pre-contact, it's not a case of farmers producing these stone tools. They're morphologically consistent. They're, type, they're technologically consistent with forager artifacts. And so again, it seems that foragers are, are spending time in the site, possibly living there, possibly just performing various activities there as well. This site also dates to the K2 period. And that's quite interesting because both of these sites date to the same period in time. And it's right about when you start to see um, the, the acceleration of social con social upheaval in this valley where you see a lot more going on. Um, but what we're seeing overall uh, is we're seeing that during this time, foragers are participating in trade. We see them producing goods, crafts, also hunting. We possibly see them specializing. I'm not going to talk about that now, but it's a possibility. Um, we're seeing them curate trade wealth of these sites. Bologna, Maine, for example, has no metal, has no glass beads. Little Mac has quite a lot of it. Uh, Zomba has a fair amount of it as well. If foragers are highly mobile and moving between these sites, one would imagine that you'd start to see a more homogenous record between them because people are moving with their toolkits. If you're acquiring wealth, you're not going to necessarily just dump it and leave it on the ground in a site uh, and then move somewhere else. Um, it, it very possibly will come with you. We see these things being moved across landscapes all over Southern Africa. But here they seem to be restricted to certain areas. So are we looking at ranking of space, different functions happening, occurring across this landscape? These are, these are some of the questions, of course, that we're looking at. But we also then see the maintenance of what looks to be traditional life systems at Bologna, Maine, aggregation happening in the pre-contact period, but it seems to also be happening in the contact period. There's very little disruption going on there. And then again, at other sites, massive disruption, the end of shelter occupation, some sites, and people seemingly moving into homesteads. In the historic period, so this is we're looking at, a, you know, um, 500 years later sort of scenario, um, yeah, actually, but more than 600 years later, we, saw, we, we have historic accounts um, by travelers in the era of hunter-gatherers living in homesteads. So it's certainly not, it's not a, but it's not a possibility. It is a possibility, but we, it's tying it down is quite tricky. We see practitioners, forager practitioners in the ritual landscape. You know, if foragers are still present at Little Muck, which I'll talk about in a moment, when it was being used as an initiation site, well, that's interesting. And Alex Kuma's work at um, rainmaking sites, she's identified stone tools, which she's argued indicate a forager present within these, within these um, rainmaking contexts or rain control contexts, sorry. And so that's also, we see this transition happening. And of course, at the same time, we see access to social status, to affluence. People, foragers are able to gain wealth items. You know, Little Muck, that's a trade center. They're producing crops there continually over a long period of time with a very standardized toolkit and also with a consistency in, in what's being produced. So when we see trade wealth like glass beads coming into that environment and metal, there's a very good indications that it is as, as wealth items, it, it, as possibly marking some kind of uh, status within society. It's not always the case, but in this particular context, which is important in these, these types of questions, it certainly seems to be, be, be happening. Okay, let me, let me just sort of, I'm going to wrap up now by, by, by running through a few slides, just catching up to speed with some of the work that we, we're currently doing. And so I've spent a lot of time obviously building a background and talking about foragers more generally in this landscape. Um, so here's a little mark, you've seen this image already. <clears throat> um, these are our excavations now at the site. So the light gray squares are uh, Simon and Ben's excavations. You can see there's two inside the shelter, and there's four outside. We've spent a lot more time here now, so we've, we've expanded on this. Not all of these excavations are complete. Um, the area inside where it says 43 and 44, when we were excavating that, we had a pretty hefty downpour of, of rain, and it wet our excavations. You can see the drip line, the dashed line coming in that actually goes over our site. So we struggled to see stratigraphy, so we need to sandbag that and we need to reopen it again, probably this year, carry on excavating there. But the site is quite shallow there. 
uh, that same season we moved um, uh, to near uh, the excavations by Simon and Ben because they had such good results there and we wanted to also radiocarbon at the sites. And we found some, we really finding some lovely things there. We tried to then expand outside the shelter. And this was after a conversation with Simon, actually. You gave me the idea and I'm very grateful for it because it's, it's producing some nice results to expand outside the shelter. Um, to try and see if there's stratigraphic relationships with what's happening outside and inside in order to look at co-occupation and chronology. Unfortunately, in that little gap of our excavation from the shelter area to the outside area, in that little gap, the bedrock rises up almost to the surface and it kind of cuts off the stratigraphy. So there isn't strat stratigraphic continuity across the site, unfortunately. But inside the shelter area, it seems that there's a bit of a bowl shape, an elongated bowl shape that's been created where along the back wall, it's quite shallow. It deepens nicely and then it rises up as you exit the shelter and then it deepens again. I mean, in these areas, what we're looking for on the outside are features. We're looking for possible indicators of a farmer presence. So in the, in the central area there where there's a big clump of excavated squares, we found a really nice big platform that we've exposed uh, that we're looking into. And then with D, we found what looks to be a moon. Unfortunately, that was at the end of our last field season. As we were coming down onto it, we saw, hey, it looks like a midden. Okay, guys, pack away. We've got to go home now. Uh, you know, kind of typical, I guess. So when we go up there in less than two weeks, we're going to be carrying on excavating that particular area. Please ignore the gray bars. I don't know why this happened, but they're all supposed to be the colors. But So this is kind of what we're finding. We're seeing a lot of stone tools, the early phases, possibly pre-contact. This is interesting because in these levels, in Simon's excavations, there were far fewer tools in terms of the density of artifacts. And they, in their excavations, the peak was in P, what we're calling here PDG1+, plus, which we think is their PGA3, based on depth and based on similarities and so on. Um, that's where their peak is. But we're seeing an earlier peak. So the site seems to have a much a, a, an earlier and, and very interesting occupation as well that we weren't quite sure of before. It may be as a result of vegetation, and maybe as a, a, as a result of activity areas, but that we'll have to look at. But if you look at all the other ceramics, the shell, the fauna, it all peaks in that PBG1 area. And so this is this what we suspect to be Zizo, based on ceramics and beads we found from this area, quite confident about that. Um, there's a lot of things going on at that time, which is which is exactly what Simon and Ben found in their, in their study as well. What we also found, which is quite cool, is in the 81,000 period after that, so the K2 period, Mapungubi period, we're finding a lot of stone tools as well, which in the other excavations, there were very few. And what we're finding is some, some very nice diagnostic artifacts, a number of scrapers and back tools. This is from a small sample that Tipe um, Sitle Kutlasi analyzed um, for his master, for his honors, sorry. Um, so it's not even from the whole site. It's a very limited section of, of our excavations. But we think we seeing diagnostic hunter-gatherer artifacts at this period, which, which to us indicates that they were present at this time. They were in the site during the second millennium AD when farmers were starting, seemingly starting to use it more often. Our work is obviously ongoing. We, we have a lot more to do. What we're looking at now is we're slowly starting to wrap up Little Muck this year and then expanding to other sites, some areas of the Oakley Hill, not the hill itself, but nearby areas we want to excavate. Um, SK, who's handing me a, it's a bangle, a, a copper bangle that we found in the shelter. Um, he, he's going to be looking at a site called Mbere, which is nearby, just outside the National Park. We have a new PhD who's going to be looking at a a more a, a broader landscape study of these sites and, and investigate issues around placemaking and, and possi the possibility of these ranked spaces appearing. So we have a lot that we're doing, uh, a lot of work um, that's still to come. And so what we're finding with Little Mac now is, is very interesting and we're really just getting stuck into it uh, in terms of analyzing the lithics and the material. So on that, I'd like to encourage anyone who's interested to please you know, follow us on social media if this is something that is up your alley. Uh, follow us on social media. We do share a lot of stuff. Um, here is a QR code that you can scan um, from your WhatsApp. If you want to join our WhatsApp community, i uh, just again like to mention that it's closed. It's only for admin to post, so you're not going to get bombarded with messages or anything odd. It's a, it's a way to just create a community around the archaeology. Um, and, and I'd also like just to finish off by saying thank you once again to the Archaeology Society and to Nick for inviting me and for assisting. Um, you can see some names up here, Peter Mitchell, Nissan Pickerai, Sam Chalice, Karim Sutter, sort of assisted over the, over the years. Uh, our, our support financially is through the National Research Foundation, the Paleontological Scientific Trust, University of Pretoria has also assisted, and we also are very grateful for the support uh, provided by the South African National Parks. And just lastly, uh, just to all the students who are involved in this project, uh, I'm constantly blessed with incredible students uh, coming to assist, and I'm very privileged to have that, so I'd just like to say a big thank you and a shout out to all of them.
thank you very much for joining me. Um, I, I hope you've enjoyed this talk and I, and I look forward to any questions uh, that you may have. Thanks, Tim. Uh, that was excellent. Yeah, I really enjoyed that talk. Um, yeah, that went uh, went nice and smoothly. Um, yeah, I'm definitely going to enjoy your WhatsApp group. That's a nice way to do it. Um, and uh, yeah, keep up to date with all your your new research, especially I think you said you're going back in two weeks. So um, this is very exciting. I'm sure you're yeah. champing at the bit to go back. Um, no, let me just, uh, yeah, let me see if we can get some questions. We, got, we had a couple of odd chat uh messages which i've deleted i think they are spam that's the first time it's mm. happened <laughs> i think uh, there's some random people uh with bots or something like that posting some things but there <laughs> is a question um from mm -hmm. kuklasi um thanks for the talk having observed the differences between these forager sites in the mlv to what extent can we say that there are differences in craft specialization among these sites yeah, so this is um, SK, who's uh, is one of my master students who I mentioned just now. I think he's trying to oh, set me up. Yeah. So I'd just like to say thank you, SK. I'll remember that. Uh, <laughs> I'm joking. Um, I think <laughs> this is a really interesting question, and it's something that we've kind of touched on, and it's something that I do elaborate on in, in my book a bit, because specialization is a tricky thing. You know, you can't just see, oh, cool, there's some crafts going on here. We've got some specialization. Um, at Little Muck, based on the work by Simon and Ben and then our analysis of the scrapers, what we found there is there's a, 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 a real consistency in scraper production. They are primarily, almost all, small, uh, of the same kind of shape, form. So we're seeing a lot of, we're seeing a highly standardized toolkit. So they're producing the same tools. We're then seeing a, a serious emphasis on, on using or working rigid materials. So people are doing the same thing with these same tools. Mm -hmm. We've seen this happen at Little Muck at one site on the landscape, um, and we're seeing an income of, uh, of glass beads, ceramics, metal, possibly also other things, consumables, that we won't get to see archaeologically, such as things inside the pots, for example. Um, so in that kind of context where you have the same stuff happening at the same site for a long period of time with the same net result, I think we can start to talk about specialization occurring at the site. In addition to that, and if you looked at our, at our, um, our graphs there, you see a serious decline in all other activities. Um, for example, back tools are, are, are diminishing. Your overall stone tool assemblage is declining. Your, um, your faunal waste is also declining. Shell waste is declining other than during that one period. So it seems that the emphasis is on the production of these scrapers and then the production of goods that they're related to. So I think we have a case here that we can investigate further and try and build some more evidence for. But at other sites, it's not as clear. Um, at, at Zombo, yes, there's certainly an emphasis on hunting. Whether it's a case of hunting specialization, when you only have a few artifacts like that, I think that's probably pushing it a bit too far. But there perhaps is some formative evidence there that may say, hey, this is something worth looking at. It would re re rely on more excavations, though. Um, so, yeah, it would be great to be able to say, look, we have a variety of activities happening on this landscape. We have these two sites. One, there's hunting. One, there's craft production. There may be other sites as well where other activities are being emphasized and other preference patterns are taking place that we just haven't excavated yet. Um, and if there's two, there is a possibility that there's others as well. There may be other sites that are craft production, for example, and there may be competing, uh, competing centers of craft, perhaps. You know, we don't know yet, but what we do know is that there are at least two sites where something is changing. Um, and with future work, perhaps we'll find other things that have changed that will add to this. And may, we may see that foragers were involved in in economies in a much broader sense. But for now, we just don't have enough evidence to really give a great answer to that question um, and, you know, give a positive answer in terms of craft specialization or any kind of specialization. Mm. Yeah, it is a very difficult uh, yeah, one to tackle. Um, but it, it looks like you, you know, you, you're taking everyone's previous work. You've got a very big database going now. Um, and you know you're aligning everything that everyone's done up um, into into one cohesive system. So um, yeah, that's that's very promising. I mean, uh, to what extent is work going on in in Zim and in Botswana? Yeah, on sort of on this on this level. Yeah, so I mean that's what you just described is exactly what we, we're trying to do. It's this incredible landscape. We have you have a, quite a lot of excavations now in a, in a fairly limited area. And these excavations are showing very different patterns at these sites, which is nice. And by bringing everyone's work in together and sort of combining and synthesizing it, we're starting to, to learn a lot about this landscape. But 
the, the bots and, and Zim are a kind of um, blank space at the moment. Uh, bots, uh, Botswana is where I did my PhD. So we do have a few sites in that area. Mostly the ones that yielded good results are mostly around the Limpopo River area. And that's probably for geological reasons because there's nice shelters down there. Um, so we don't have a lot in that immediate area. Um, in Zim, there were some excavations in the extended region in the 60s, for example. But it's very difficult to relate that to what we're looking at now because we have very different typological, different, different typological systems and forms of, and approaches to our analysis. So integrating that is quite tough. So those are two landscapes that there's a lot of room still. Um, Botswana, certainly, um, there's a lot of sites there. And in Zim, there's two farms in particular which have remarkable rock art and shelters. Um, I think Ed Eastwood did a lot of work up there. And um, he's, I think one of the sites that he looked at in his records is something like, something absurd in terms of its size. It's a, it's a massive ridge that runs for 200 meters and there's rock up in it in various areas. Not, I don't think it's the whole way. Uh, and, and on the floor, there's a lot of archaeology as well. So these are really big sites too. So there's absolutely scope for work to be done there. And it, I'm sure it would, would, would provide really interesting results, you know, in terms of a landscape scenario and, and and, and, and you know, relations with these different sites like Muffin Group went on. So, yeah, it's, it's still a case of filling in a lot of gaps, but, you know, slowly but surely we'll get there, I think, in time. Mm, mm. Oh, absolutely. Let's mm. see if we've got any more questions. All right. So, uh, there's about, there have been about 20 people this evening. Um, yeah, as I say, we did unfortunately lose um some of our audience from last week um but um hopefully they will they will watch this uh, very soon um are there any questions anybody else um let me just send them a, a message quickly um well, any other questions yeah I mean, I think, you know, this, with, with a lot of the work that we're doing now there's also there's more hopefully you know more patterns that will start emerging as well and um one of the interesting things that I'm looking forward to, and I'm just talking to you to fill the space as well while we wait for questions, but one of the interesting things that we're looking at now, I'm excited about is, is the excavation shifting, you know, from Little Muck to areas around, you know, the Lyokwe Hill, an area of Lyokwe Hill that we're going to look at where there's a lot of evidence of craft production as well. The uh, 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 SK site, um, Mbere, which is really interesting because there's a K2 terraced site and at the base of it is a shelter with, with, with later stone material in too. And so we're starting to what we're trying to do with our work as well is to think, kind of think outside the shelter in, in a way, uh, and think well we are interested in hunter gatherers that is our interest, um, but hunter gatherers aren't exclusively in shelters they're in these other contexts as well so it's quite our project now is going to take a bit of a different hue in the fact that it's now going to start to look for hunter gatherer traces in in otherwise sort of farmer spaces as well and I think that's going to bring in some interesting results too. Obviously we're focusing on the more prominent sites for now um, and the more the sites greater potential. But that certainly will, you know, bring new elements to our understanding of this, this landscape and the role foragers played within it. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I agree. Um, yeah, well, I think we've got uh, a happy audience. Um, it seems like all their questions have been asked, answered. So thank you, um, SK, for your very good question. And um, yeah, I think, uh, yeah, I think it's uh, time for Tim to go have some beer. And um, yeah, thank you to the audience. And uh, Tim, thank you very much. That was an excellent talk. Um, yeah, your your um, graphs and your visuals are were superb. Uh, you, you have an amazing size to work with. It must be an absolute pleasure to, to be up there again soon. Um, so, um, yeah, and I just really, really appreciate you coming out twice. <laughs> Sorry about last week. No. Um, yeah, we got escommed um, to <laughs> last week. Um, and uh, yeah, when you down the Cape, we'll just have to arrange a, a very good bottle of wine for you and we can uh, get together and catch up. Yeah, no, thank you very much. Uh, um, no, we, we are very excited to get to the field and um, hopefully we can share some more results soon with everyone. Super. Well, have a lovely evening and um, yeah, just uh, have a wonderful week and uh, we'll catch you hopefully on our, as a viewer on our next uh, talk in April. I think it's, uh, I think it's Genevieve Dewar um, is the next one, but um, yeah, until then, um, thank you again. We really appreciate it. And uh, yeah, this is really a great talk. Thank you very much. Thank you so much. All right. Have a great evening.